All right. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for uh, joining us. This is a Buddhist Geeks conversation, and I'm joined today by Ken McLeod. Uh, Ken is a regular conversation partner and uh, guest on Buddhist Geeks, so it's great to have you back, Ken. Thanks very much. It's good to be back here, too. Yeah, and good to see you again. It's, it's been a while. It, oh, it's been a long time since we've seen each other in person. Yeah. And um, fortunately, we've got um, a lot of people tuning in live for this conversation. We decided um, we're going to talk for a little bit and then uh, at some point open it up for um, questions and comments from the folks that are here live in the Buddhist Geeks community. So, um, so we're, we're exploring this question is tradition obsolete? And we got several really good comments and questions even before um, we started today about what tradition is, what we mean by that. Um, and then you had some thoughts, I know, some initial thoughts on the topic. And I figured maybe we could just start there and, uh, and let it see how it goes. Well, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I'm coming at it from, for, for two different reasons. Uh, one is I've just finished a, or just published a book, uh, which is a modern commentary on a very, very traditional text and a very traditional teaching. And uh, it's Reflections on Solo River. It's a commentary on Tumi Zongpo's 37 Practices of the Bodhisattva, which is a very well-loved text in the Tibetan tradition. And... Um, People have naturally said, well, what has this 14th century poem got to do with us today? Uh, and that's, that's a very common uh, question that comes up. I mean, I mean, there they're living in a totally different society. Why, 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 why did you spend your time on this kid? <laughs> okay, so I've got to be prepared to answer that question. The second uh, reason is that, or, or impetus for this for me, there's a short discussion I had with a philosopher in England who uh, kept asking me in a, in a few email exchanges why I was, quotation marks, hiding behind tradition. And, and I thought this was just a really strange way. He said, why don't you just say what you think in your own words? And, uh, and, I, and I found, I, I need to reply to him because I think he's, he's deeply wrong. But I haven't found the language yet to do so. I thought so. I thought talking about it with you might might help me in that. So those are my two interests in, in, in it. Uh, and uh, what about yours? Mm. So so part of what we're doing is constructing a, a, a rebuttal to this English philosopher in this conversation, um, or at least thinking through that. Um, yeah, I mean, for for me, the the my interest in this conversation, this topic, is it has a lot to do with what I'm observing in the sort of technology space and in the kind of just social space, the cultural space, where everything seems to be changing even more rapidly than it has in the past. And so um, this question of how do we work with traditions that have come um, from thousands of years ago even uh, through people's lived experience, how do we relate to those when we're dealing with some this new situation where the change itself isn't static. It also seems to be changing and getting faster. Um, well, yeah. I think that's very true. Uh, when you look at the development of the printing press, which I think is was an invention that was analogous or comparable in impact to the development of the Internet, uh, the printing press was developed, in, uh, was, was first developed in Fortran. 1453, I believe, somewhere around there. But it was 100 to 200 years before books in their present form emerged. They didn't start right away. It took them that long to work out the book format uh, and, and, and for people to get used to it, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, but in, in today's age, uh, we haven't even assimilated really email. <laughs> Uh, uh, but we've had several other technologies which have leap, leapfrogged uh, beyond email. And so we don't even have the time to assimilate and, and uh, set up a political and cultural structure about one technology before another has emerged or before several have emerged. So I agree with you completely that the pace of change uh, has, has increased sharply 
And this question about what tradition is and, and, and even how we, we, we maintain culture and, and governance uh, in a time when the very modes of communication are, are changing. I mean, how many of us use floppy disks anymore? And I hope I'm not embarrassing myself with your audience by making such a reference. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think everyone tuning into this will probably be able to remember when they did use floppy disks, but it's been a while, I'm sure, for most people. Yeah, yeah. no, it's uh, those are some great points. Um, so, so, so I guess the first question that seems to come up when we start talking about something like tradition is, well, what is tradition? Because obviously there's got to be different ways of defining and describing and um, kind of uh, beginning to illuminate what this thing is that we're calling tradition. And maybe the Buddhist way of looking at tradition is different than some other ways of looking at it, so I'm not sure. What is tradition, Ken? What is this? Well, I think that is a crucial question, uh, and it uh, came up in, in the pre-discussion discussion that we were having, I think uh, Linda Wright uh, said, for this language and culture um, yeah. have to do with this. And I, I think she's right on the money here, uh, because I think language, language and culture have a huge role, to, uh, uh, play huge roles here. And uh, the fact is that tradition means different things to different people. Uh, for some people, uh, tradition means uh, the way that things are done, that is, the forms and the rituals. Mm -hmm. um, for, for, for other people, uh, tradition is the sense of an unbroken line of transmission. Uh, uh, for other people, it is a, a, a school of thought which is passed down from generation to generation. And, uh, and I think that I think it's very important because when you talk about uh, maintaining a tradition, uh, well, those will mean very, very different things depending on what you, you take as tradition. And yeah. th this has become quite, uh, it's, it's been important in my own teaching career because, uh, as, as you know, I have a, a little bit of a reputation as being somewhat controversial. And so I would get people who would come to my retreats um, expecting, you know, something quite radical. And, uh, and and they said, they would come to me after the retreat and say, no, you, you don't have any of the usual forms or whatever, but in many respects, you're one of the most conservative teachers I've ever run across. <laughs> so what I was focusing on is tradition, and I'll speak for myself personally right now, is... Um, uh, within the context of Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism anyway, which is my training, is a, um, a, a, an understanding of a, uh, an experience of a certain quality of wakefulness in, in one's life. And uh, for me, everything else is secondary to that. But that is not what uh, tradition means uh, to a lot of other people. So there are these differences. Mm. Mm. So when you say that like people experience you as being extremely conservative, now I've hung out with you, and I haven't I haven't uh, done any meditation training with you, but I, in my experience, that's not how I would exactly describe you. <laughs> it, well, what do you mean when you say that that you're extremely conservative? Is it in well, terms of the that training? They, I don't feel like, well. I am, and I, yeah, I, I suppose it's fair to say I do in a certain sense. Yes. Uh, well, let me give you an example, uh, which, which opens up a whole other topic, so this is a little bit dangerous. Many people uh, approach uh, or become interested in Buddhism because they're interested in how Buddhism can help them in their lives, if, if you follow. Sure. And, uh, and and then we have things like uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, MBSR, which has taken Buddhist tools and developed methods which are immensely helpful to hundreds of thousands of people and reaching far more people than any, quotation marks, traditional Buddhism would, with a possible exception of uh, Soko Gakkai SGI. Uh, I have to confess that the question, how will Buddhism help me in my life, 
has never ever entered my uh, my mind. It was never my motivation. It was never my interest. I was interested in a certain kind of understanding, um, a certain kind of knowing, a certain kind of awareness that Buddhism seemed to talk about and point to, and uh, that was very important to me. And whatever happened to my life as a consequence of pursuing that interest, well, uh, it, it shot my life to bits <laughs> in, any, in any kind of conventional sense. And so, in that sense, I'm, I'm, I'm quite conservative. I'm really interested in what, and I'm speaking personally again, what I regard as, as the core of Buddhism, which is this quality of wakefulness. And that's what I seek. I, I use the, the methods and tools in which I was trained helps uh, people cultivate that in their lives. And that includes traditional meditation such as death and impermanence. Because what death and impermanence does is uh, it, it, it changes your relationship with life. Uh, and, and when you really assimilate the fact that you're going to die and you do not know when, your interest in conventional uh, notions of success and failure changes and changes quite deeply and and it's, it's in those kinds of things i think people would regard me as a conservative teacher okay so it's in the sense that the way that you understand the core of the training that you've done around the certain kind of wakefulness and the tools and the models that you've used to to deepen your understanding of that regardless of um, the results it has in your life in terms of conventional results like success in some sort of financial or emotional or so, some other sort of success metric like that, that that there's something useful there and that you don't see it anywhere else presumably and so that you continue to I, offer I, that training. I, I would agree with everything you've said except the word useful. No, I don't know whether it's useful or not. It's something I am interested in. <laughs> Okay, so it's a, it's not a utilitarian approach, then that you're taking here. No, it's not a utilitarian approach at all, and, and it's in, in that spirit that I translated this text from Tomi Zongpo, uh, because he wrote this text as a reminder. I, I think he was coming from a similar place, and he he was told at a certain point that if you want to, you need some money. Why don't you? do initiations or give empowerments or do rituals for the villagers and then you get lots of offerings and then you'll be able to take care of yourself. And this materialistic approach to spiritual uh, ceremony so offended him that he sat down and wrote this poem to remind himself of what the really important spiritual values were. And that, I think that's one of the reasons why it's become such a loved text. And in commenting on it, what I've tried to do is to, to take each of the verses uh, and put them in a thoroughly modern context uh, with very little reference to traditional uh, quotation marks, traditional teachings. Uh, but what does this mean in their lives today in, 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 in terms of the quality of wakefulness and compassion and so forth? But it's, as you just said, it's not a utilitarian approach to practice at all. Okay, interesting. Maybe, maybe we can go back to the utilitarian part because. So, I guess I'm so deeply programmed as a utilitarian thinker that it's hard for me to completely believe that people don't do things because they want something from it. Um, so we'll have to maybe go back. <laughs> well, I, I think that's a really important point, Vince, and I'm happy to uh, uh, to uh, pursue that. And we can do so in a number of ways. But where would you like to go at this point? Well, yeah. What, what, how would you how would you respond to that? Maybe maybe to start, and then we can maybe find our way back oh, okay. into tradition. <laughs> well, uh, okay. Well, I think we can find a way back in tradition fairly easily here. I, I think we're hitting on a very important point. Uh, when it, let, let's take the analogy of art. Uh, it could be painting. It could be sculpture. It could be dance. Uh, poetry. Uh, really, any form. Uh, now, why does, a, why does an artist pursue his or her art? Well, if, if you look at, at, at the way, I don't know whether it's most artists, but, but certainly many artists, uh, 
they aren't interested in success in the conventional sense. Their prior, for many artists, their primary interest is giving expression to something that they feel or sense or feel that they know or whatever, and, and they're, they're trying to give expression to that. So they aren't really looking at what they're going to get from their art in terms of money or success or recognition or all of those things. If those things come along, it's very nice. But their primary consideration is to give expression to this artistic impulse. And, and Rolke says this in Letters to a Young Poet. He says, if you can possibly learn or live without being a poet, do so. But if you can't, then here's what's involved. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So, so I, I think, and art also has traditions, and, and, and the nature of tradition has changed dramatically. In, in, in art compared to what it was 200, 400 thousand years ago. Right. So I think there may be some useful comparisons. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense and I want to go into those comparisons because we've, we've talked a bit about that before and in particular uh, maybe it'd be fun to talk about this whole question of now it's difficult in some sense to even define art. Like even the artists don't know what art is so I wonder if there's any relationship there to what what we might go through uh, with kind of the contemplative wisdom traditions um, well, I, I think I think we're right in the middle of that. Uh, well, maybe we're at the beginning. But, but I, yes, I think it's a very, uh, I think there's an analogous question. I agree with you. Interesting. And going, going back to what you're saying, though, um, you know, just to, just to, to push a little harder with my utilitarianism, um, <laughs> When, when you say when you give the, uh, the the analogy of the artist, you know, and, and I understand that I think, oh yeah, like there, there's something creative um, that wants to come through that person. They have this particular talent and this drive that they can't really, they can't really, in some sense, even describe where it comes from. They just know they have to do it. And yet, yes. with now within, so so in terms of they're not looking for conventional success in terms of the broader culture that they're in, perhaps. But but then they find themselves right in these little subcultures of other artists who are also trying to do that. And then now you start to have a, a reference point for a new kind of utilitarianism, which is how can we be, how can we be most successful at bringing forth that? You know, like, and then they're always, I'm just saying, it seems like no matter, no matter where you find yourself, even if it's among a very small group of esoteric geeks, you still end up trying to, you know, to, to, to get something, uh, to have some new metric for what success looks like and, and to kind of share in that with others. Hmm. I'm sure, I would agree with you. Okay. Um, I mean, in, in one sense, you, you, can, you can reduce everything to what do I get out of it. Yeah. Uh, but, I, but I think that when you do that, you reduce everything to a transactional relationship with life. And I think you impoverish life and you impoverish practice and you impoverish art by, by insisting on that reduction. I, I think what you said earlier is, 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 uh, leads to a richer uh, a view of things. When you said you know, the, the, an artist feels something, and they, don't, they may not even know what it is, they may not know where it comes from. But there is this impulse which uh, drives them or leads them to uh, to express it, and they look for the right expression. Uh, and and uh, maybe they find it, and when when they do, there it is. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it is the it is the, the act of creation itself that is meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, and. And that's different from what do I get out of it now that I produced it. Yeah, yeah. No, I I get the distinction. I guess I guess I just uh, it seems like going through that process will change someone, and and usually we do a good job of sort of rationalizing our you know our trip. As one of my one of my friends put it, we're always rationalizing our trip. In that, uh, yeah, I think that's a very good point because. Uh, uh, what would it be like to live without rationalizing your trip? I mean, that, that, I mean that, that's I mean, my question. Be, yeah, well, I, I think that is... Is that a new trip? 
is that a, is that the new trip that we're on? Is to to not rationalize our trip? Well, you you can turn anything on itself like that. Yeah. But I'm not sure what you what you, uh, you know, and, and uh, I'm not sure what uh, my picture. Oh, there we are. Uh, I'm not sure what you get out of by by reducing it to that. Uh, I think the, the the question is, what would what is it like to live without rationalizing your trip? Now. When you ask that question, at least when I ask that question to myself, uh, something opens up, and, and you know I'm, I'm I'm no longer trying to justify my life to anybody else or even to myself. And there's an extraordinary freedom right there, and I, I and, and this is I'm just thinking out loud here now. But mm -hmm. you could look at Buddhist practice and maybe some forms of art, etc. As attempts to uh, or, or efforts in living your life without any kind of rationalization. Okay, I'll 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 buy that. I'll buy that for now. I'll let that slide. <laughs> <laughs> Is that code for I don't want to touch that one? <laughs> no, no. I think it's. I think it when you when you describe it as a as a moment. As a momentary reflection, I, I have the same experience um, that that you described. Uh, even as you were describing it, I sort of was like, "Yeah, what would it be like?" And it oh, it does open up a space. Um, I guess I'm just uh, so aware of how quickly, and this I think ties into the question of tradition becoming obsolete. How quickly we take this thing that works, you know, it works for a moment. This question. And then, and then, how quickly I I've noticed over and over. I'll take this the model and practice which brings freedom, and it and it sort of opens things up. And suddenly, I'm in this open space where anything's possible, and I'm not rationalizing my trip to anyone. And then suddenly, like you know, it suddenly starts closing in, and it starts getting real. And now I want to tell everyone how to <laughs> how to live this way because it's the best way to live. And and I build you know, and then we build tradition. We build. You know, we build this layer of, uh, uh, and it gets, and it gets really, at a certain point, it gets really stale, or it can. So I guess that's my oh, question. You're quite right. Yeah, no, I, I, you're, you're quite right. There's a, a profound human tendency, or you found probably the wrong word, um, a strong human tendency to do exactly what you're talking about. And uh, this was one of the reasons for the stick in Zen Buddhism is to beat this out of you. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but you remind me of, of uh, the way I like to translate the uh, first line of the Tao Te Ching. Um, a way which becomes the way is not the way. It seems to be exactly what you're talking about. There's, and, and you're quite right. Tradi uh, one of the ironies about traditions is that traditions form when somebody does something untraditional. Yes. That's a great and, point. Yeah, and th that comes from a person called Stephen Fuchs, uh, who wrote a very good book uh, on sociology theory called uh, Against Essentialism. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a difficult book, but it's, it's, it's very, very good. Uh, but that was his, 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 uh, one of his points, is the tradition started when somebody does something untraditional and says, oh, no, this doesn't make sense, we're going to do it this way. And everybody says, oh, this is terrible, and you can't do this, etc., etc. And then you get into, I think it's uh, Schopenhauer, I can't remember, who said that a, a, a new truth is first greeted with laughter and derision, or ridicule and, uh, ridicule and laughter. It is then met with violent resistance, and the third stage is it's accepted as common sense. Hmm. So, and, uh, so the beginning stages of a tradition are usually pretty rough because you are departing from the established norms. But when what you're doing it becomes effective, uh, then people start saying, okay, we'll try this, and, and, uh, and so something begins to form. Now the irony is the moment you talk about preserving a tradition, it's dead. Hmm. Because preserve is what we do to things that are dead. Yes, we're trying to preserve something like you would for a museum. You know, you want to be able to show it off for later generations. Yeah, yeah I, I, and keep it in keep it in its present form, 
Yes. And, and so nor nor change, and so it, it ceases to be alive and evolving as a response to the situations around. So in this sense, you know, tradition is something that is, you know, practically speaking, uh, fluid. And what a, what what a lot of people regard their traditions are are ways which have uh, served uh, in the past, uh, but no longer continue to serve. Now, having said that, I have to qualify that very very strongly. Mm. Because, uh, particularly in the domain of spiritual practice, and, and probably in the domain of art and other areas too, but I know this better in the domain of spiritual practice. When when you practice a certain way, you get used to doing things a certain way, and uh, doing those things, performing those rituals, or just going through those procedures, prepares mind and body for whatever spiritual exercise or practice you're doing. And that is one of the great powers of, of tradition, is that because there's a set way which you've trained and become accustomed to, then you just, as soon as you enter into that space and start that process, everything shifts in you and, and you move into what, essentially what you're trying to cultivate or uh, express. And that is one of the great values of rituals and rites and certain traditional forms of behavior is that they are expressions of and reinforce those um, uh, ways of being in oneself and um, w without them you're kind of lost and, and the, the Catholic Church went through this very significantly when they dropped the Latin Mass and the, the, the Mass was said in the, in the vernacular in the local uh, uh, languages, uh, because they had been used to, everybody had been used to doing it for centuries, and some people were never able to relate to Mass in their native language in the way that they were able to relate to it in Latin. So, yes. it's difficult, you know, they, these are complex questions. Yes, yes, and I mean, I, 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 can, I can really relate, I, I was, uh, to, to what you're saying now about ritual and I was in San Francisco at, at a dinner um, with with some people, and one of the guys was um, a professor, and he worked um, he worked in you know one of the kind of most highly theoretical research centers in the country um, on like chaos mathematics or some craziness, and and at a certain point we were talking Buddhism came up because of because of my role there being you know representing Buddhist geeks at the dinner. And he said, you know, the, the, I liked some of the ideas from D.T. Suzuki, but the thing that really, really, really I never got, and it just makes me mad, is this whole thing about ritual. And he just hated the notion that you had to perform these meaningless, empty rituals, um, and that, that just didn't make any sense. And so I, I can sort of see what you're saying, that with the loss of these certain kind of traditions, like my grandfather, I talk, we talked about this before, uh, before this conversation, you know, my grandfather grew up in a uh, in a Muslim country, and he grew up practicing, you know, the the five day uh, five five times a day prayer and the you know call to prayer and 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 sort of doing that in community and the practice of it. And then when he moved to the United States at 18, it just disappeared completely from his life. And I, I suspect there are a lot of people like that who, at one point in their history, um, had some sort of tradition or ritual that they probably came from religion in most cases, that, that they could use to kind of train their minds in a particular way. And we do seem to be, in a sense, anti-ritual across the board as a culture, um, or at least kind of at least yeah. kind of in a core. Yeah, yes. Uh, you're now touching on some other areas. Uh, because you have these rituals. They are in the final analysis, arbitrary. Okay. Uh, I mean, they were all developed by particular people for particular purposes. Uh, some of them may have claimed divine inspiration or, you know, whatever the equivalent is in Buddhism. Uh, but they are the product of human beings. We, we know that. Uh, and when, when you understand and have are steeped in the, the culture, and this is where culture comes in very strongly, then, uh, and, and the language, then uh, these rituals become uh, intensely meaningful 
can be intensely meaningful because they uh, are evocative of uh, internal experiences or understandings or ways of experiencing the world, etc., etc. If one comes into them without that, or if one performs them without that sense, then they can be experienced as empty, meaningless rituals. Mm -hmm. they, they don't make any, any sense of, uh, from the outside. So I understand where your uh, physicist uh, is coming from. Uh, and one of the challenges, this goes back to what uh, we are talking about in terms of rate of change, things are changing so fast that it's, it's questionable whether we have the time and the stability in our culture to actually develop rituals that have that kind of power. Uh, at least for a large number of people, because circumstances are changing so much, uh, yeah. and 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 they need the investment of a certain number of people for them to inquire, uh, to acquire that that kind of uh, power. Uh, it, it's one can do it to a certain extent by oneself, but only up to I think up to a point. And then another notion came up when you we were talking about is why do uh, rituals become meaningless for a person even if they've trained in that tradition mm. and here, here I want to introduce a very different idea and it comes from a, I think a theologian but a university professor at New York uh, New York University uh, called James Cars and he offers the definition of religion as very long-term conversations, long-term meaning centuries-long conversations about certain questions, and when you uh, and each religion has its own core questions about which this conversation is taking place. In Buddhism, I think the question is very clear. The question is, how do I live my life and not suffer? How do I experience what arises? And not suffer because we're always struggling against what is arising in the experience. We either want to try to own it, that's attraction, or we want to push it away, that's aversion, or we block it out, uh, you know, we just are indifferent to it, which is ignorance. And so we have this, these three poisons relating to experience all the time. And the Buddhist answer, you know, this goes right back to the basics of terrible Buddhism like, dislike, and uh, plus that, plus neutral. You learn not to react to that. And now you can experience your life without suffering. Yeah. Uh, in Taoism, the question is slightly different. Uh, how do I live in balance with what arises in experience? Mm. It's close, but slightly different. Christianity, I think the question is totally different. In Judaism, I think it's totally different. I'm not clear of what the question is in Islam uh, or Hinduism. I haven't explored that. Matters much, but but I think it's a very interesting uh, way of looking at religions, and 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 it, it explains, uh, and it touches on what we're talking about. You, you might say a tradition is, uh, in, in religious sense anyway, a tradition is uh, a way of talking about a certain question over centuries. That's yeah, that's really interesting, and. I, I like I like that a lot because it sort of seems to extend to other areas of human knowledge and exploration. You know, what are um, some of the ones you're thinking of there? I, I'm thinking of like the physical sciences. You know, like physics. You know, what is this all made of? Um, you know, that that seems uh, yeah, to be okay. a question. Yeah, well, it's made of nothing as far as we can tell. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, you, but you know what I mean. There, there are certain questions that kind of drive yes, right. all areas yeah. of exploration. Because physics, you're quite right. Physics is interested in what is the stuff made of, whereas biology is is, is interested in the question of what is life. Yeah, what is life? But, right. What are the characteristics of life? Yeah, which is not a question that comes up in physics at all. Right. Right. Interesting. So. So, so we, I think when we look at it from that frame, when we st this always blows my mind looking at all these things as responses to questions, um, because not only are there sort of in important questions that different people over time have been asking, but then those questions have been asked in ever-changing conditions and ever-changing contexts and cultures and you know uh, economic situations, and so it seems like the questions themselves are going through 
kind of process of of change that I, that we're never going to kind of grasp the final answer in that sense. Well, yes, and no. Um, you, you remind me of, of some conversations I've had with Stephen Batchelor, and uh, he suggested uh, that I read uh, Don Cupid, uh, C U P P I T T. I think he's a retired Don at Oxford, I think. Uh, Stephen knows him personally, has uh, given talks with him, etc. But uh, Don Cupid wrote us a, a little pamphlet called The Great Questions of Life, in which he goes through the 16 great questions uh, which are being asked. And, and uh, he, he goes through it and says, you know, many of these have been answered. Science has answered them, words in earlier times, science didn't have the answers. Like, you know, where does the universe come from? What mm. is the that. Um, you know, what is the purpose of life, etc. And so he says, well, you know, these questions have been answered, kind of drop away, and these questions uh, cannot be answered. We know that we, not, we now know they cannot be answered, and, and so forth. So I, I think that the questions that a culture asks itself uh, changes uh, from time to time, depending on, on, on what kinds of knowledge and uh, Understanding that they have of the world, mm. so uh, and uh, Don Cupid's uh, idea uh, is that the whole conception of religion is changing globally. Uh, right, uh, and and I tend to agree with them. And it's not something that's taking place just within Buddhism; it's taking place within Islam, very definitely, and Christianity, and Hinduism, etc., etc., etc. Is, is this the same guy that talked about life being the new totalizing concept that's sort of replacing yeah, God? Yeah, I mean, there's some YouTube videos of him. You just have to uh, type in his name. But one of them, uh, he, he, gives, uh, he pays close attention to language. And when, when a, a great person dies today, or no, you know, 100, 200 years ago when a great person died, particularly in the West, it would be said of him or her, that uh, he loved God. Uh, that would be the defining characteristic. Uh, you know, yes. the same humans, whatever. But you almost never hear that said these days. What you hear instead is he loved life, or she loved life. Right. And so, yeah. And this moves us from the notion, and, and this talk about changing tradition. This moves us from the notion. Of the, the purpose of spiritual practice is the transcendence of the human condition to the notion that the purpose of spiritual practice is the embracing of the human condition, uh, you know, in, in the sense of groundlessness and so forth. And that's a very, very radical shift, which, uh, which I think many people are struggling with uh, because it, it requires, uh, to a certain extent, the adaptation. That, and uh, changing of, of, of the tools. The tools are still very effective, very powerful. I mean, you take something like not only your consumption. Um, those, yeah, ultimately, I think you're stepping beyond either transcendence or imminence, but the whole debate there. Hmm. But, uh, but the emphasis shifts, and, and, and thus the forms of practice and what is regarded as practice and what is regarded as real understanding changes. Uh, and one's looking for a quality of presence in a person rather than quality of other worldliness, if you see what I mean. Yes, yes. And, and, and I find that really interesting that the perhaps the response to the questions, even within Buddhism, have changed, obviously have changed over, over the years in different places by different people. And some of those answers in some ways are more resonant with the the answers that people are looking for now, or the questions that people are asking now, like with, like with the you know like a non, like a non-dual Buddhist tradition might be that that notion might be a lot more resonant, you know, uh, than the transcendence model of classical early Buddhism or something. That's that's fascinating in itself. Okay. Um, Ken, I'm, I'm wondering um, if there's something. Uh, I mean, this is a broad. This is such a broad topic that we've kind of gone in all sorts of different directions around it, and I don't see any problem with that. Um, I don't think we answered the question. <laughs> I don't know that that was your ever your intention. So, um, 
I mean, is, Buddha, is tradition obsolete? Yeah, I don't know that uh, we ever came up with a true answer to that question, but uh, nor do I think well, we necessarily will. Yeah, I mean, I, I think certain aspects of the role of tradition in our culture is, 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 is changed and is changing from what it was 100, 150, 500 years ago. Yeah. That, that, that much is clear. Uh, that being said, uh, there is value uh, for a good number of people in a body of knowledge which has evolved and uh, weathered the, the storms of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, that once that body of knowledge becomes solidified and is sought uh, and ceases to evolve, then we can say that that tradition has become obsolete. Okay, that's interesting. So, so there's in, in some sense, it seems like there's a lot of context dependentness on this the, with this question. You know that a tradition could be really good at answering a certain kind of question, but if if it's if that tradition enters into a context where that question isn't valued, um, then that would make the tradition obsolete immediately. Well, that's exactly what happened to the North American Indian in the 19th century, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think there definitely, definitely weren't uh, cultures that really meshed well together, that's for sure. Well, they didn't, they didn't mesh at all. And, and, and Everything that was of value and made their lives meaning, uh, meaningful suddenly had no context, and, uh, and, the, uh, and it's hard to imagine a shattering of one's culture of that magnitude. Uh, and, uh, there's a book there read about Plenty, the last great uh, crow chief, mm. and uh, one person said, you know, uh, and uh, when. Uh, after the buffalo were killed, nothing happened. Well, obviously something happened in all Western America developed this country. But from the point of view of Native American culture, they didn't know where to go. I mean, they, uh, they had great difficulty in rebuilding that. And I think they've come a long way now. But, uh, but it's hard to imagine going through such a cultural shattering of experiences that yeah, it would be. Would be. I think you're right. And, 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 and all your traditions are suddenly rendered completely meaningless. That's that's jarring. That's really jarring. Hmm. So I'm wondering, maybe if we, um, as we as we wrap up, if we could pull in some questions from people that have. Uh, I'd be happy. Been tuning in. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So. Let's let's take a couple here, um, and and can you just let me know when 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 we need to stop? We can uh, can go for another little bit on my end. So uh, just let yeah. me know. So uh, how do, uh, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm open time wise, but uh, how do we do? How do the questions work here? Yeah, so I'll just um, I'll read them off from our uh, from the Q and A app, and um, th there's a I don't know if you've seen the system yet, but people can put in questions or comments, and then then people you know you can vote. You can plus one things that you like, so so certain things sort of move to the top. So we'll just start at the top and and work our okay. way down. Um, so uh, so Dwayne, people vote on the questions. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah. So um, Dwayne Miller um, had a question here. Uh, maybe tradition is not obsolete, but rather is and must be flexible, much as Buddhism has always been as it has moved from region to region. Do traditions need to change with culture and technology to be relevant? Question, and then he sort of answers uh, tentative, probably yes. Well, uh, traditions do change with, with uh, technology and culture. Hmm. I mean, uh, all of the oral traditions had to adapt to the existence, uh, to, to the development of books. Uh, and, 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 and that uh, Socrates uh, railed against writing as, as destructive of, of memory. Writing is another technology. Right. Uh, so, uh, so 
we're going through a period of profound technological change and it's influencing us deeply culturally. Uh, the, the, the danger, uh, I don't say danger, challenge to be better. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, I know this doesn't sound very uh, articulate, but it, it really is a case of, I think, of muddling through. Uh, in that uh, people experiment with all kinds of things like uh, holding on to this aspect of the tradition but letting that aspect go and uh, people making all kinds of different choices and over time the choices that seem to work in the emerging culture uh, hopefully uh, will come together though I'm not sure that there's always a guarantee, uh, guarantee of that uh, here the forces of evolution come in start to play very, very strongly. But, uh, but I think the essential point of Twain's question uh, is that if traditions don't evolve, then they die. Uh, right. They become, uh, 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 become increasingly incapable of responding to new situations. They may change more slowly, uh, and, uh, and that needs to be paid attention to. Uh, an interesting book, if, if some of the people listening are interested, uh, Pursuing this is uh, Neil Stevenson's uh, Anathem, in which uh, uh, people in the monastery are, are put into people with a 10 year focus, a 100 year focus, and a 1,000 year focus, so that they had these different. Uh, and, and so they, they focused on uh, what was relevant within those time frames. Uh, and, and, and this led to very, very different results, but it was a way of balancing all of those different uh, demands, the very long term. Versus the short term. So, so I think that's a real challenge. Mm, interesting. Okay. So so I mean, one thing I'm hearing from this that's kind of interesting, and I wonder I wonder if you'd agree with this, Ken, is that in some sense we're living in a period of time where experimentation uh, greater experimentation is okay. That there, there's more space to experiment and to try new things and to kind of remix and um, and re reprogram and, and create new New ways of of doing things, and in some ways that might be uh, if we're looking at the forces of evolution. You know, having a bunch of different varieties of things all, uh, usually tends to be better than having just a couple, right? When you're dealing with intense change. Um, well, when you're dealing with intense change, you're going to get a, a wide variety of things because all kinds of new possibilities are being opened up. Yes. Yes. Interesting. Okay, and you know Kevin Kelly, um, who's a writer. He's the editor at large at Wired magazine. He he wrote it in What Technology Wants, an interesting book about um, how most past technologies um, continue to exist, but they're held by a very small number of people. Like like if you look back to the 17th century Kentucky flint rifle, there are a handful of enthusiasts who still um, you know how to do everything that was ever done with the Kentucky Flint rifle. It's st they can still produce it. They they you know basically are the holders of that area of wisdom. But for them, it's you know it's like their their side project thing that they are just obsessed yeah. with. Um, I'm but, curious if you think maybe the same kind of thing happens with um, happens with these religious traditions. Um, well, undoubtedly. I mean, there's there is one letter press still in America that is you know where they make the type out of lead and set it, the original typeset. Their books cost hundreds, if not thousands of dollars because it's labor intensive. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm in the process of becoming obsolete, so you and I discussed this. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's exactly as you describe, uh, in that uh, because of the advent of newer technologies in the uh, distri distribution, dis dissemination of meditation instruction, um, I'm completely obsolete from that point of view. NBSR, other forms of, uh, you know, eliminated as uh, Little Big Britain says. The primary dispensers of meditation instruction are now academics and, uh, and um, healthcare professionals. Uh, so the kind of people that I work with are people who have a, a very different interest in spiritual practice. And uh, the audience is much smaller, uh, and, and it's more focused. So I, I haven't 
there's no danger of going out of business, but in terms of influencing the culture of our Giano, that was pretty awesome. Uh, that's interesting, and I, I, I sort of take uh, I, I take comfort in the recognition that though that these things continue to be out there at least to yeah. some degree, because they're they're almost like seed repositories, you know, like in those kind of dystopian novels where you have the seed repositories where you can go and grab them if you need to regrow something that like got lost. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good analogy, mm -hmm. and this is not the first time it's happened. My own. Um, line of transmission, which is the Shanka uh, transmission, was a, uh, was, it's, it, the main vehicle of it was wiped out by Tibetan politics. So it became a very, very fragile lineage being held by a very, very small number of people for uh, several hundred years uh, and, and enjoyed a bit of a resurgence in the 20th, 21st century. But uh, it's exactly as you're saying, the, the, the seeds of these things. Uh, are preserved from generation to generation, and that, that can be important. Mm. Okay, one, one more question here. Uh, Jason Lay, uh, he said, that this discussion of utilitarianism and motivation makes me one, wonder if at least one function of tradition is to catalog the benefits of practice. Aren't many of the old sutras list, lists of these benefits? Ah. <laughs> uh. Well, what's this? What's this response about Ken? What do you? What do you? What do you what's so funny? <laughs> the what I find uh, richly ironic is that uh, as uh, Jason is, yeah, Jason says, the, the sutras cataloged all of these benefits. Uh, and I've, I've read all of these things, and that's nice. Yeah, and you get that. Result and get this result. And that, and that. It just didn't work out that way for me. And I realized over time that my interest wasn't in getting those benefits. Uh, so I came to the possibly somewhat jaundiced view that all of those lists were attempts to persuade people to practice. Hmm. <laughs> That's why I was laughing because hmm. I just don't put. My, I mean, if if you're coming at this in order to get a benefit out of it, eh, you're taking a utilitarian approach. And it's very different from the kind of artistic approach that I was talking about. Yeah. And, and, that's, and that's a personal matter. And, and for some people, it's a matter of evolving, that they start off with a very utilitarian interest. You know, and they, want to, they don't want to experience so much stress in their lives. And then they found that something is waking up and responding to this. And then they come at it with a deeper motivation. And they come at it with a still deeper motivation. And this kind of evolution takes place. So I don't want to say that it's wrong to come at it with utilitarian uh, motivation. I find that if it's limited to utilitarian motivation, then I think a tremendous amount of the richness of uh, the spiritual training is lost. That's my main point. Yeah, and is it lost because of of the kind of preconceived notions of what it's a, like what it's capable of, and is that sort of how you see that get, getting lost? That's one of the, one of the things that leads to lost because you're trying to make things conform to a picture, mm. and, and 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 whereas in fact you may find yourself going into into areas of your life or into areas of experience that you didn't even know existed, and. Uh, and, 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 and so it becomes a wonderfully enriching and opening. And in, in a field, like in the field of art, you know, to go back to, to our metaphor here, our mixed metaphor, um, you know, I was thinking how, what an interesting parallel it, it is because in art, you know, someone breaking the mold and doing something completely novel, in many cases, is celebrated. It's not. Uh, it's like, oh, wow, there's a new form of art now, <laughs> you know, that, that, that never existed before. And often technology is one of the drivers of, of that also, the new art forms spring yeah, into but, existence with new technologies. But that wasn't always the case. Remember, Stravinsky's sure. Rite of Spring, people went out in the intermission and bought rotten tomatoes from the marketplace and then came back and hurled them at Stravinsky. <laughs> wow, that, that's interesting. Uh, let's ima imagine hearing Stravinsky and then just that kind of reaction to yeah, the, right, to the, the right, right of Spring. spring. <laughs> They, they were just so offended by it. Ah. And so, so new forms of art aren't always celebrated. That's, again, a cultural phenomenon. 
Yeah, and and it's probably you know only within certain kind of cultures would would even now would that be celebrated. I mean. Yeah. It depends on, I guess it depends on which culture you're in, depending on whether or not you celebrate it or curse it, or just ignore it. <laughs> and we're back into the usualness. Yep. <laughs> okay, la la last question if you have time for it, Ken. Yes. Um, okay, great. Oh, this has been a fun conversation for me, so I hope, I hope it was... Uh, I won't say useful, because I don't want to fall into that trap. <laughs> I hope it was at least interesting. <laughs> well, I, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it too. What's, what's our final question? Okay, from Amy Donahue. Um, she says, spiritual values tend to be fairly consistent across traditions, even when the teaching and practice of those values differ greatly. What is, my, what is meant by tradition in this context? Oh, that's, that's a very, very good question. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind... Uh, response to this question was a, um, I attended a panel at uh, USC, uh, Univers uh, University of Southern California in Los Angeles, uh, several years ago, on um, uh, what is the um, role of religion in, in, uh, in a globalized world or something like those things. And one of the panelists described the following experience. He had been part of a group of religious leaders that had been brought in by the government to talk about um, what government policy should be on certain topics which uh, where these religions differ very, very strongly. These were civilian matters, secular matters, but the, uh, the different religions had different views. And so the, the, uh, in the morning, it was a, a, an all-day session, in the morning they introduced uh, these things and they asked them to debate and come to agreement. And the morning was just a mess because these religious uh, leaders talked about it from their different religious traditions and, and, and they were just at each other's throats. However, the facilitator uh, of the conversation must have been someone very, very acute because after lunch, instead of continuing that discussion, the facilitator brought in uh, several different scenarios saying what should what should the law be in this situation uh, and then described a very concrete situation and what what should the law be in that situation and described another one or, or what should government policy be in which it was law policy and then they found that all of the the leaders basically agreed on what should happen in that situation but justified it by very, very different means, according to their tradition. Huh. So, so, so that's so, interesting. Yeah, I, I, I just found that fascinating. And, and so the, I, I think we have to be very careful about saying that spiritual values generalize across traditions. Uh, because I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm on dangerous ground here, but I'm, I'll just you know, go out on thin ice for now. I'm not sure that we can really formulate the values uh, and separate them from the language. Mm. Um, but I think what is really important is to see how it takes expression in actual in life itself. Uh, and and, uh, and so you, you you can have rabbis who are devoid of compassion and, and, and take really hard lines, uh, and you have rabbis that are, are, are full of compassion and uh, 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 and understand what needs to be done with situations. It's just the same as way as you know, Tibetan Lama is doing the same thing, or uh, Catholic priests, or what have you. So I think it's really important to focus on how does this actually take ex expression. And there, there's another aspect here, which I think is also uh, being careful about generalizing too, too much, and that is, that morality, and, and a lot of this in here we're talking about morality in one form or another, uh, had several different dimensions. Um, there's a book, I can't remember the author, called The Righteous Mind, which explores this quite deeply. Uh, but you have, you know, fairness, and you have uh, do no harm, and you have loyalty, and you have purity, and sacredness, these different aspects of morality. And 
uh, everybody agrees that morality has all of these different dimensions. But what people really don't agree on is which are the more important. Uh, so some people rank um, purity way above fairness, and other people rank fairness way above purity. And those lead to very, very different forms of uh, expression in life. Right. So, uh, and, and this is not relevant, not relevant only to spiritual practice, this is also relevant to uh, political uh, issues, because uh, the same kind of thing happens. And, and so, I, I'm a little leery of generalizing across traditions because there's a tendency to ignore these kinds of variations, which are very real and very important and have to be taken into consideration. Mm, okay, so, so there's some sense of... Uh where the abstract and the and the concrete meet. That's a, that's a very good way of putting it. Yeah, uh, you know, you, you need to take it to, uh, to look at that. what is actually manifesting and why and, and, and where it ranks in that. Because if you just deal with abstract principles, then you, you know, don't worry. You really are in concrete situations. Yeah, yeah, and I I really appreciate your point about the about about the language part um, because. We are diff dealing with different, even different languages, coming out of different cultures. I mean, that that's got to be the one of the weirdest parts as a translator. It's like you're not just translating <laughs> from like an earlier version of English, <laughs> which would be hard enough, but it's like translating like across language and culture and time and geography and um, and, and and trying to sort of understand what does it mean. Um, well, we can yeah. certainly dive into that one, but perhaps now is not the time. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a whole. Maybe that's a, that's a topic for our next conversation. Well, that um, would be fun. Uh, yeah, I'd happy, great. I'd be, I'd be happy to do something on translation because there's, yeah. uh, there, there's a. I think it affects people in ways that they don't even know that it affects them. So I think it might be very good to talk about that sometime. Yeah. Well, I found so interesting in in the different aspects of morality that you're bringing up. So many of them are just one word, you know, and it's like. You know, you you have this one word purity, or this one word fairness, and and all of the things that come with that single word. I mean, yes. it's like compressing it down to its smallest, and yet within that is a huge, vast territory of of yep. things to explore. So it's interesting. All right. Well, um, I think we're out of words for today. Uh, at least I am. <laughs> but uh, thank you, Ken, for uh, for joining us and and for exploring this question about tradition and 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 what it means for it to be alive and what it means for it to be obsolete. Fascinating. Well, my pleasure. I, I, I very much enjoy our conversations. And, uh, thank you for this opportunity. And it's good to chat with you again. Yeah. And I really like, and I really like uh, the fact that we're able to take some questions from some of the listeners. Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's great to have everyone involved in the conversation. So thank you, everybody, for who tuned in live, and um, we'll see you again sometime soon. Okay. All right. Take care. Bye, bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, Ken.